Hi and welcome to this video in the MRDCL Fundamentals series. In this video we're going to be looking at basic table definitions, the sort of table statements that you'll be specifying probably on your first projects and just covering some of the things and disciplines you'll need in writing a table stage in MRDCL. So this is a fairly standard project. It's uh, got some variables at the top and some questions relating to brand awareness. And as we scroll down, you'll see that it's got gender, age, and number in household. I'm just gonna draw your attention to these variables because we are gonna do some work on these in a second. So we've got a variable here which picks up an integer which picks up the actual number in the household and then a variable that puts that into some ranges. So we've got one, two, three to five and greater than five people in the household. And then down below that, we've got a variable called my banner, which picks up the gender just as it is on the uh, variable definition at the top where it picks up codes one and two. And then we've got age grouped into code one or bit one in the variable age with two and three combined together. And then the number in the household has been picked up as one to two and greater than two. And you can see the labels down here in my banner. Now let's look at the table stage and look at some of the things that you typically set when you're setting up a table stage. So if we scroll down, the first thing I'm gonna draw your attention to is some settings at the top. And you can see here there's a global BT hash. Now what that means is for every table, I want the base title to be all respondents. The hash means table, a dollar would mean variable. It's very rare you use global BT dollar, but people do use it occasionally. But global BT hash means by default for every table, I want the base label to come out as all respondents. And then when we do want a table filtered, what we're gonna do is replace it with a base title that only applies to that table. And we'll look at that a little bit further down. Another thing you put at the top of your uh, table stage typically is some format options. Now, often there's a whole long list of these which you probably use from project to project or copy from project to project. They vary obviously from user to user. And the two we've got set here are DPR1 and CLW7. So what that means is that for all the tables that follow this, we're gonna set DPR to one, which is the decimal places for percentages. So we'll get one decimal place. And the width for each column in the text file will be set to seven characters rather than the default of five. So that's a setting will apply to each table. We can reset that anywhere we like if we want to. So we could set DPR back to zero here by saying F equals DPR zero comma, and that would reset it from this point onwards in the tables file. You can see that format options are delimited by a forward slash. And of course, there's more than one type of format option. You have format options that take a numeric value like the two we have here. You have format options that are called logical options where they're true or false. If you want them turned off, you'd put an N in front of the three digit code that represents that particular format option. And there's a small number of options that deal with characters. So the character for zero, for example, is controlled by CAZ format option. And if you want to reset that, you put it in a single quote. And that's been covered, I think, in previous videos. So these are the format options, and there's 250 of them. I'm not gonna go through them now. There is a video that covers format options in a little bit more detail, which you may care to watch. Now, moving down the script here, we find the next line in the file is a percentage JH. And this is one of a family of special labels that allow you to set particular texts that appear on a table. So percentage JH, that's actually setting the, the job header. So it's gonna set our job header that will come out on every page of a text table and at the top of a CSV file output as brand awareness project. And this is a label control which we can count it elsewhere, which will center it for us. So less than JC, greater than means center that job header so that it appears in the center of the table. Then we've got another uh, special here called JF. So all specials begin with a percentage. And JF is gonna have the text produced by MRDC software. And this particular special is gonna pull in the date, 
the month, the year, and indeed the hour, and slightly logically, the minutes past the hour are NN rather than MN because MN means the month, and SS the second. So what we're going to get as a footnote on every table in a text file will be the date and time of the run, which can be very useful if you're running something repetitively or periodically just to check that any updates to your STP file, you can check the date in the Explorer, for example, against the date in the uh, footnote of the table. So that's a useful tip. Then we move on to yet another special, and this time we're, re we're replacing the standard mean score label, or the average label, with the words mean score. And more than that, again, we're using a label control here, D2, which will uh, set two decimal places for the mean score. The next line is setting a standard banner for all tables. So what this means is where there's no banner specified, the banner that will be used will be the variable called my banner. Now you may recall that's my banner, the one that we define there at the bottom of the data stage. So that's going to get applied to every single table unless there is a cross break or a banner used on any particular table specifications. Now the next thing to note is that you'll see there's a piece of preprocessor code here called set t equals zero. And what this is being used for is to step the table numbers up automatically by one. And there's a good reason for that. First of all, MRDCL expects you to have a unique table number for every table. So you can't have two table ones, you can have, must have table one you could have 1A, 1B, 1C, but you can't have two table ones. There is a cheat to get around that, actually, if you do want to have two table ones. You could call them 1 and 1A, for example, and there is a format option called NAID, which suppresses any alpha in the table num number or table name. So if you had 1 and 1A with a table ID, 1 would come out as 1, and 1A would strip out the A and just look like it's table 1 as well. However, coming back to the point here, it's a good idea to use this option where you set t equal to zero in the preprocessor and then use this tool to step it up by one. So square bracket plus t square bracket will step up the table automatically by one. And the reason for that is if you produce a run of tables with perhaps 50 tables in there and you delete some or you add some in the middle, your table numbers will remain sequential. Now, there is a format option, again, that can get around that for you. Format ATM will automatically table, uh, number your table sequentially. So even if a table is called Table 2, and there's a 1A and a 1B, it will number them 1, 2, 3. Now, I don't particularly like that format option, although it, it, it performs the function of making table numbers sequential. I don't particularly like it, because then it's quite hard to match up the table numbers you've got in your output with the table numbers you've got in your script. And so if there's an error, what, it, what appears as table 42, perhaps in your table output, might be table 53 or something, or the 53rd table in your uh, script. So I don't recommend using that unless you, you really think it's a good idea for a particular project. So now we come to the table statement. So what this is going to do, it's going to call that, because it's plus t, it's going to step t up by 1, which will obviously give it the value of 1 as t starting with 0. It's going to output there table 1. And you'll notice here in brackets, it's got some more format options. Now what these format options will do is they'll replace or override any previous setting for format options. So remember, format options start with default settings. They can get overridden by having a global format statement like the one we have here. But then you can override them yet again on an individual table. So at this particular table, BRS will take place, which means blank row suppression. So any rows that have got zero in them will get removed. And although we've got DPR1 just a few lines up, this will set this particular table to DPR0. We'll get no decimal places for our vertical percentages. The table we've got here now is Q1 asterisk. Now there's nothing after that asterisk, which means that it will use my banner as the banner across the top of the tables because it will take the default select banner. 
if you haven't got a select banner in there, you're just going to total only column because there wouldn't be a standard banner for every table. On to the next table. This will be called table two, just DPR set for this table. Now here, it's got Q1 as the rows, but it's got Q2 as the banner. So my banner won't apply to this particular table because Q2 has been specified as the banner that's required for that particular table. So you won't get my banner. On we go to table three, or what will be the third table. Stepping out by one, giving me Q2 affected by my banner. On to the next one and the next one. Then we come to this particular table, and you can see here that it's filtered on the variable gender. So only the respondents who are gender value two, the females, will go into this table. And there'll be a, a base title coming out of all females, because this base title immediately follows the table before it, and therefore it will replace the global base title of all respondents with the text that we want on this particular table of all females. On we go to the next table, and now we come to a table that's worth understanding, and this is where you do a table with a mean score on the bottom of distribution table. So here we've got the variable called V number in household. If you remember, if we go back up, that's the variable that picks up the number in household of 1, 2, 3 to 5, and greater than 5. So that's going to give me a table there. But you'll see on the bottom, or underneath that, I've got plus t. So it's going to, the plus means put it on the bottom of the previous table. So although it looks like two table statements here, it will come out effectively as one table. And you'll note here, I'm not stepping T up by one. I've just got T in square brackets, so it retains the value of T at that time, which will be, I think, table seven. So it's going to restore or keep that value of seven, but it can't be the same table number. It wants an X on the end to give it a different table number, and that's just my way of remembering that a mean score table has an X on the end. And then to get the actual mean score, we put at in front of that integer, and it will give us a, a, an actual mean score based on the real value of the number in the household, rather than any average or anything like that. So that's got our run prepared. Let's run it, and let's look at those tables and see what's happened. So we look at table one. We can see all the headings are centered for us automatically. We didn't do anything there. We didn't get any decimal places for our percentages because DPL was turned off and the columns have been spaced out a little bit because we had CL and W7 set. So there's our table and all the rows have been suppressed that were blank. So the brands ABC and so on aren't present because we use format BRS. We scroll down and on table two, we get all the brands, even the ones that are zero. It was cross-analyzed by brand uh, by question two, question one by question two. So all the brands are, are there in both directions for question one and question two. And we still got no decimal places. Now we come to the third table. And this time we have got decimal places because the global format option of DPR1 is taking place. And that's giving us 50 point naught there rather than just 50%. On we scroll to the fourth table. And there's another table coming out with the same sort of options. On we go to table five. Now table six was the one with the filter. So here you can see the text all females has been applied rather than the base that's been applied on the previous tables, which was all respondents. So we've got all females coming out. And you can see this table is only based on the one person that's a female in this table. And finally, we come to the last table, and here uh, we've got brands considered, and I was wrong there, of course, the final table is the number in the household, and here we've actually got two table statements. That's the main body of the table, if you like, and this is what we plus T on the bottom of the table to get the actual mean score. So that's the table with the X on the end that's giving us the actual mean score so we can see from this table that the, that the male comes from a household of six people, the female with a household of two, 
which gives an average of four. And you can see them dropping into the relevant rows there to match that data. So that's going through a very simple script, setting up the basic sort of tables you might encounter. There are other videos that are going to take you through more complex tables like summary tables and many of the other types of tables that you want. I'm just going to draw your attention before I finish on one other aspect of uh, MRDCL here. And I'm going to do something purposely wrong here. So if I copy this table here and I take the plus off, what I'm effectively doing is I'm going to have this same table twice. Now, the way MRDCL works, and it's a reason actually why table numbers have to be unique, is that I'm going to get table 1 here, because plus t is going to set it from 0 to 1, and I'm going to get table 1 here. Now, the effect of that is everybody's going to go into this table twice. So if I run it now, you'll find, somewhat confusingly, that table 1 now has four people in there, even though there are two respondents, and both these figures are doubled. So in fact, this table is completely wrong. Now, there are times when you want to do this. It's called overlaying tables. And the reason for doing it is that you sometimes want to add different people to different rows or columns of the table. Or perhaps you've got different occasions uh, where you've asked people to fill in their eating occasions over maybe five days. So they could go in to a table uh, more than once, maybe 15 times for three eating occasions over five days each. So that's the reason that you want that facility in there. It will be covered more fully in a separate video so that you understand that more. So that completes this video on basic table definitions. I hope it was useful to you. There are, of course, many more videos in the MRDCL Fundamental Series. Thank you.